Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have returning guest, Dick Allgaier. One of the top remote viewers on the planet, Mr. Allgaier is also one of the real men who stare at goats. We're going to discuss several fringe topics tonight. These are different projects that Dick has been a part of for the past 10 years with the Farsight Institute. If you'd like to know more about his work, please check out the Farsight Institute. Um, you're also a great guitar player. You've got a really cool YouTube channel, Dick. Um, but some of the topics we're going to get into tonight, folks, is there was a base on Mars or what clearly looks like a base on Mars that there's pictures of from JPL's own photographs and satellite. And one of the most incredible anomalies that I've ever had a chance to talk about, the Iapetus moon and the structures that Dick had remote viewed there as well as Daz did. So, Dick, it's great to have you on here with us at the Leak Project. How the heck are you? Hi, Rex. It's great to talk to you again. It's good to be here. Where, where are you right tonight? Where are well, you located? I am located in San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, Texas. I have some relatives that want to move there and are trying to talk me into moving there. But I'm in Hawaii, and right now the sun has just gone down, and it's still almost 80 degrees. I'm in shorts and a tank top here in January. Yeah. Okay, you're jealous. Well, I got to tell you, the weather out here is, is pretty much the same in San Antonio. I got up this morning and went down to a park and swam in a beautiful lagoon, swam a mile out in the wonderful warm ocean, saw some turtles, and uh, yeah, it's great being in Hawaii. Well, I guess you could go to great. Corpus Christi and swim out there, but the water has a lot of oil slicks, so by the time you get out, you might feel a little numb. <laughs> Corrects it, too. Oh, yeah. All the stuff they put in for that oil spill. Yeah, yeah. That's unfortunate it is i don't know if you've ever thought about remote viewing that that might be a really cool project actually yeah what well, you know i'll tell you something about remote viewing is you never think about what you might remote view because as a viewer you have no control over it you're blind um the rule is no target talk like i I can't suggest targets, or it's best not to think about targets. Um, it, it has to be done in a way that targets come up totally unexpected. Now, I could think about tasking that to another viewer. Um, and you can do that, but as, as for self-tasking, that's something I never do. So I, I can't choose my own target. So all these targets that you're talking about tonight and we're going to review tonight were things that I never suspected, expected, or had any part in the selection of. It's just like, here's a set of numbers, target 14, go. Like, oh, I have no idea. Well, and so, I recently saw the one you did with the JFK assassination. That was amazing. And when I watched you do the remote viewing session on there, this this was classic. You're You're writing everything down on the whiteboard. You're writing down what you're seeing and you're really into it. And then you look at the camera and you go, you stop and you look at the camera and you say, am I remote viewing the bleeping JFK assassination? <laughs> Is this the effing JFK assassination? Yeah, it kind of dawned on me. You know, well, we'll, we'll get into that session because we, we have a long interview. Let me, let me tell you a little bit, if people haven't heard this, how I got involved in remote viewing because uh let me take you back to the beginning i was a television newscaster i grew up in salt lake city utah as you know worked there for 74 to 10 years um was just a regular guy you know uh tv anchorman producer reporter not too much into new age or consciousness type activities. Uh, the thought of it sort of interested me a little bit, but I never was involved in any way. I was just a normal nine to five working reporter. Moved to Hawaii in 1985. Got a job here, became an anchor man, television reporter. Uh, for 10 years, I was surfing, having fun, doing the news, starting to kind of listen to 
you know, in the early 90s, late night radio, Art Bell, that kind of thing, and heard Dr. Courtney Brown, someone said, hey, this professor from Emory University uh, did a thing called remote viewing. And about that time, I read a book by Howard Bloom or Blum, B-L-U-M, Howard Blum, uh, about what was the name of that book? Howard Blum out there. That was the name of the book out there. It was about UFOs. And in the book, he said, well, there was a remote viewer working for the government and he saw UFOs. And I thought remote viewing, what's that? The first I ever heard of it. So then I heard Courtney Brown say that, yeah, this is this technique that the military developed and regular people can do it. And he had his book, Cosmic Voyage. So I thought, if that's true, that's remarkable. That, that's got to be, that's amazing. I want to know about that. Now, I didn't think that I had any talent for it. I didn't really have too many natural precognitive or psychic events. I don't think any more than normal people have. Like I'd, I had a few. So I here I am a newscaster in the mid 1990s and my hobby became in my spare time investigating the possibility of remote viewing so I went and took a class I practiced a little bit and then I hooked up with a military guy here in Hawaii that was teaching classes and I started taking a class every week 97 98 99, Y2K, 2001, pretty soon is 2005, 2007, 2008, we're still going and I'm still going to class every week, still learning, still doing targets. So I put a lot of work into this. Um, so that's kind of my background. I'll stop talking and let you ask a question here. Well, and that's one thing too is, you know, is with anything else, if you want to train to be a cyclist or a marathon runner or like you go swim a mile, you're not going to be able to swim a mile just the first time you try it. So the fact that you've got 10 years of experience and training underneath somebody that was with the military that has that experience certainly helps with what you do. And, you know, to put 10 years of your life into something, I mean, clearly you must have really had a passion or really have a passion for it. Well, oh, absolutely. And now it's been uh, 18, almost 19 years. So I've put almost two decades into it. And I was very dogged and determined. I mean, I was, uh, I won't say obsessed, but I, I did do a lot of sessions. I mean, I've done hundreds and hundreds of targets and the more you do, the better you get. So I, I put a lot of hard, hard work into it. And, uh, anyone who wants to learn to remote view, I would say you can, um, you can amaze yourself in a couple of weeks, but to really get to a high level, it does take a lot of work. It's like, playing guitar, playing piano, you know, it's a, the more you practice, the better you get, the better you get, the more you like to do it. And the more you do it, the more you practice. It's a, it's a repeating loop. Well, I remember reading a book called Initiation in Hermetics and Franz Barden is the author. He passed away many years ago, but he was really uh, ahead of his time as well to the point to where Hitler actually kidnapped him to try and use his mind to help win the war. But in some of the stuff that he talks about, clearing the mind, uh, seeing things in the mind that might not be there, using your imagination to do so, there's these different applications and exercises that he states, you know, you're not going to get there in a night. It might take your whole life to accomplish these goals. And with what you do, I mean, there's certainly practical applications if you look at the, uh, the steps that are required to remote view something, how you clear the mind and, and different things that take place. But do you feel that you're at the point now to where if somebody gives you a target that you can, I mean, pick up on it pretty much 
50% of the time, 70% of the time, what would you say, statistically speaking, the accuracy of your abilities to remote view something? Well, gee, I haven't uh, calibrated it in that way. I, um, I pretty much... I, I might have uh, 20% of sessions, like two or three out of 10, where first try, I might get nothing. I might be totally off. Um, there, it's like a bell curve. Most sessions, if I get my mind right, I will get some good data. Like you can see some target contact. Um, some of it's good, some of it's bad. And then there are those, uh, occasions where you are just on, like I've had some sessions where 90% of the data that I produce is good. That doesn't mean that you, you get 90% of everything there is to get about the target, but of the things that you write down, you know, on a good day, 80 to 90% of them are right. We always feel that target contact remote viewing sessions are a combination of good data, bad data, and then some data that is you perceive correctly, but you misinterpret it. So it's always a, always a combination. And you know, when you're talking about, uh, and we're going to talk tonight about Iapetus and uh, Mars and even JFK and Hitler. Um, I, on all of those targets, I did get some verifiable data where if it's Iapetus, okay, I described the crater. If it's Hitler giving a speech, I did describe a man uh, in front of people giving an impassioned speech. So you can you can validate that. But some of the other things, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, a civilization on Mars, it may not be true. It, it might be true. Parts of it might be true, but I just don't know until we get corroboration. It's a remote viewing is a really, um, it's a slippery thing, Rex. Uh, it's, it's just fascinating, but how much of it is true? You can only know that on completely verifiable targets. I hope I answered your question. It's, uh, you know, I, Courtney throws this out. Oh, Dick Allgaier is one of the greatest remote viewers. Well, on a good night, on a good day, I'm a, I'm a pretty good remote viewer. I don't think I'm the best. And on any given day, I could be, I could embarrass myself and a novice viewer could, uh, do a better session. What you strive for is consistency the more you work. Well, I got to say, every video that I have seen you in, what you're showing on, what you're writing down and visualizing and experiencing certainly correlates with what Daz sees and with what the project was presented to you guys was supposed to be. So, I mean, like in this first one that I wanted to talk about with you, I've always been fascinated with Mars and the anomalies on planet Mars. The movie Total Recall portrays this giant pyramid that was built by Martians that can create this atmosphere if the button is pushed to activate it. And this top or this target that you and Daz remote view, and I know it was done a few years ago, but it's certainly, I think, pertinent to today where there's this dome looking structure and then the steam that's coming out of it. I was wondering if you could get into that with us and describe what the structure actually was in your eyes and, and get into some detail with that, please. Okay. I've got to go back in time to, um, my Mars history is, let's see, I did a Mars project for Courtney and that was like, six years ago maybe uh yeah no 10 years ago i think it, it was quite a while ago that was that was the mars anomalies the dome structure mm -hmm. and the spray structure so that was like a decade ago 
And then more recently, we did Sidonia Mars. And that's, uh, that's something that I did last year, a year and a half ago, two years ago. So, okay. These, these to me all run together. Okay. So we'll go back to that first one. Um, I did get a very clear visual of the spray. Uh, if you, did you ever see that? If, if I'm trying to think of, boy, I'm looking at the published. screenshot. Oh yeah. I'm looking at a matter of fact, for those that are listening, please go to the farsight.org and look at mysteries. There's the location on Mars that we're going to be talking about. The photograph that was taken by JPL, the act, you can see the spray, you can see the domes, you can see the different targets. So yeah, we're looking at it right now. Well, that that when I saw the feedback picture of that spray thing, and I looked at my work, I went, "Oh, wow! I was right. I was right there. I saw that." So I did get a clear visual of that, um, and I did describe it as some type of outflow. Um, then there was another. Uh, Let's see, there was another aspect of that target that was the domed thing. And it was in that that I uh, – th this is interesting. I I'll, I'm remembering back. Okay, that was like – okay, I'm, I'm underground and I'm looking up and there is a – you're in a big structure. And this would be like some kind of underground – facility that was very big and I remember seeing an artificial sky so that if you were within this structure you would be looking up and it would be like uh you know how they a few years ago talked about nanotechnology like they could make a house that you would look out and you would see a vista yeah that was totally fabricated that that was my sense of this base is that you were underground, but when you looked up, you didn't see girders or rock cave like formations. You saw a beautiful blue sky with clouds that was totally fabricated, like a uh, projection, uh, nanotechnology project projection with like a sunrise, sunset, uh, different weather patterns. But it was all generated. That's my biggest memory of that domed uh, structure. Um, as in terms of what it was or why, what its function was, I can't remember too much. You know, sometimes um, remote viewing doesn't give you a 360 degree omniscient view you might spend an hour working a target and that doesn't mean you know everything about it uh you you get like you're there and you go oh this is a structure it's underground and, oh look up oh there's a um and you get this realization of the sky is artificial it's not really sky it's a structure that they create to look like a sky but it's really realistic um there was some shielding, electromagnetic shielding, so it couldn't be spied upon. I think that was some of my data. Um, Do you remember the people? I didn't get too much about the the people on that one. Um, yeah, I don't. I didn't get too much of a sense of the now, people unfortunately i remember when we talked to courtney about it he said that in the data there were people there now that didn't know how to actually use the technology from the structure and he said that he didn't think the people that were there now were actually martians i don't remember who else i talked to if it was maybe you uh, uh, several years ago and you said you thought that they were possibly martian or maybe it was daz i I can't. Remember. I think that was Daz because I don't recall any of my data being that complex. Okay. And also, yeah, yeah. So that that probably would have been Daz. You know, when when viewers, uh, two or more viewers work the same target, they tend to divide it up. So one viewer might get the structural 
aspects, and another viewer might get the life form aspects, and another viewer might get the uh, you know purpose. So it, there seems to be on a subconscious level a uh, division of effort at the target. So I think in that one, Daz got the inhabitants more than me, and I got the structure itself more than Daz. Now, were you involved in the project with the exploding planet and the asteroid belt? Yeah. Yeah, I did that one. And I, I um, that was interesting to me because I got a big explosion, like outward energy. I, I saw it. It was like a look kind of like a sci-fi movie computer generated explosion in space kind of thing. I mean, it was a big uh, explosion with something just shattering uh, to bits. Now I'm trying to remember back. Boy, that one was over 10. That might've been, Let's see, 2004. That might be 12 years ago I did that. Wow, time flies. Yeah, but my my <laughs> sense of that one was, uh, yeah, big explosion. And the, the question Courtney was trying to ask, uh, what he was looking at in that one was, what caused the asteroid belt? Um, and I think pretty clearly it was an explosion. Uh, he feels it was an exploding planet, and that's consistent with the data that I got. Were you able to find out what it actually was that caused the explosion? I don't remember. I no. I I just kept getting this. I remember thinking, and you're not supposed to think this, but I'm thinking. Okay, this is an operational target. This is a project that someone's in in uh, uh, very curious about, and. You're thinking, is it a missing person? Is it a future event, you know? And, fully in, and all I got was this big explosion in space. And it was like, it's hard to get your bearings because if you're witnessing this explosion from far away, I mean, if a planet explodes and you see it ex explode the size of a baseball, how far away from it are you? Your 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 awareness is pretty far away. So, um, I never was on the planet at the time, and I didn't get a sense of like nuclear, electromagnetic, or uh, collision. All I got was, "Wow, this is an explosion." I should look that up and review that. You know, I do so many targets over the years that they kind of meld into this stream of consciousness sure i mean it's absolutely. like it's like trying to remember a dream you had a couple of years ago makes sense you got to have your dream journal with you to look at the notes so yeah 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 we've no. been keeping dream journals lately some of us uh with some astounding results i might do a video presentation about following some dreams and acting on dreams. I don't want to say right now what it, what it was, but uh, several of us did uh, pay attention to dreams and act upon them, and damned if they didn't come true and guide us to a proper, uh, a proper outcome. And I, I might make a video on this. It, it might be a year before I do it, but boy, I'll come on your show. That'll be an interesting one. You know, yeah. I think... Dreaming might be another subset of remote viewing because remote viewing is just communication with your subconscious or we're now starting to call it your higher self, your another part of your conscious awareness that is outside of your physical conscious mind. And when you remote view, you do a set of drills and protocols and structured methodology that puts you in a way of thinking that lets your subconscious or your higher self put data into your conscious mind and you train yourself to do that. I think you can also do that in a dream state because when you're asleep, your conscious mind is relaxed in delta 
not aware of your surroundings, and it's an opportunity for your subconscious or higher self to communicate to you and give you some ideas and advice and counseling. And if you, uh, I mean, if you say dream journal, do you do that, Rex? I do, and you're bringing up the Delta state. I, I don't know if you've ever had an out-of-body experience before, but about 15 years ago, well, I, actually, it wasn't quite that long ago. It was probably about 12 years ago. I had an out-of-body experience as I was going to sleep, and I wasn't even trying to pursue it. it. It scared me so bad that I woke myself back up, and then as I started to fall asleep again, I, I did it again. I, I went out of my body, and I could see myself and my surroundings, and, and it was just very weird. Um, so have you ever had an experience like that? Oh yeah, I did, uh, before I got involved with remote viewing, this would have been the early nineties. I bought the Monroe Hemisync. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I went through all of those, uh, with a very dedicated, uh, intent and, uh, I got very relaxed and, you know, tingly. And (laughs) one time I popped out as a, whoa. It did. It did startle me, uh, looking down at my body. So, and I had one. Here's a cool one. This was after I was a remote viewer, and I was flying trans-Pacific. I was flying from Hawaii to uh, either San Francisco or might have been Thailand. I, I was I was flying over the ocean. It was a long flight. And so, you know how they serve the meal and then they play the movie and then they kind of shut the, shut the, uh, windows so it gets dark. And they, I think they turn the air off so it puts you to sleep. So I'm there in the plane and I'm drowsing, getting drowsy and I'm thinking, okay, I'll, I'll remote view. And so I'm kind of doing a little mental exercise to put myself out and I was just going to kind of freeform remote view and damned if I didn't pop out of my body and up out of the top of the airplane and suddenly I was aware of like through the skin of the airplane into the jet stream in bright sunlight and it was so startling it was a <gasps> I popped right back in and and awoke. It was very startling, but yeah, went right outside the airplane. Now, and do you feel that remote viewing and out of body experiences are one and the same? Not exactly. I think the, I think where you go in the advanced stages of remote viewing can be a kickoff to that kind of thing. So it's similar in the style of remote viewing that I do. Let me explain you, you, um, you might meditate or listen to some music, get yourself, you want to clear your mind. So your mind is kind of quieted, but still when you start out and you pick up a pen and you have a blank sheet of paper in front of you, you're in a pretty much beta awareness. Uh, you're pretty much awake and alert. And so you're, you're kicking off the remote viewing session by doing almost bookkeeping clerical things, writing your name, writing a page heading, making a little squiggle and your target contact is limited to one Two, two seconds. It's just you stop and you get this little flash of an idea. That's that's in beta. As you work the session and you go page after page, it's almost like working a crossword puzzle where you're making up the questions. Uh, 20, 30 minutes in, you get to that kind of daydreaming state where you're kind of segueing into alpha. You know, when you read a book and you're not aware of turning the pages and you're not aware of writing on the paper, you're just, you're getting more and more caught up in the target. Then at one point, 
you put your pen down and you do a little breathing and visualization exercise and you go to theta, which is, um, you know, that place between being asleep and awake. Right. And that's where it really kicks off into the fun part. Um, it's not exactly trying to be out of body, but when I get to that state, I mean, there are times when I did the, when I did the, um, uh, uh, JFK target, I had a moment where I blacked out and it wasn't like an out of body experience where like I was, Oh, I've left my body. I'm floating, you know, where I want to be and, you know, free form the silver cord or whatever. Right. It's more like, all of a sudden you're having a dream and the dream becomes reality. And where I was, was uh, I just, I had blacked out and then I came to, and I was in Dealey Plaza. I didn't know it was Dealey Plaza, but there was green grass and blue skies and some buildings in the distance and a few people. And I thought, Oh, I'm here. Where am I? What do I need? To? In the minute I thought of what I need to do, that brought my conscious mind back into it, and I woke up at my desk working the remote viewing target and went, oh, damn, I lost it. Now, it sounds like this is fun to you. I mean, you enjoy it, don't you? Oh, it's it's um, it, it's actually not that much fun for me while I'm doing it. It's It's kind of hard work. It's, it's like, uh, it's a delicate balancing act and you're unsure of like, if you're right or wrong and it's, uh, it, it's fun kind of after when you've done it and you've done the whole session and you've recorded it, the payoff is getting the feedback and, and being done with it and looking back over it and remembering what you did. I mean, of course it's fun. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun and I wouldn't do it as hard and as, uh, as determined as I do if it wasn't fun. That's, that's one thing Courtney and I, when we work together for these Farsight projects, uh, the number one rule is it's got to be fun. Nice. If we ever stop having fun, we won't do it because I don't get paid for it. You know, it's not like a job. Well, it's, it's almost like Avatar, you know, where you can tap into another consciousness or another time. You can be a time traveler. You can, I mean, you really are a pioneer of this. In my opinion, it's almost a revolution. You know, I mean, if, if people can learn how to harness their minds and do what you can do, what Daz can do, what Courtney can do, it doesn't seem like he really does it much anymore, though. He's more of the director. Yeah, Courtney doesn't remote view that much, but you know, I'm working on a documentary with Daz. Let me give you a quote from Daz. Uh, I've got my, I just transcribed this interview with Daz when you said, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, no problem. Oh, I'm, I'm okay, thinking of that um, TV series Heroes. Let me, the, let the me find this. They have. this uh, he, he, it was a great soundbite. Um, okay, here it is. I'm sorry. This is Daz speaking, and I, I just got a video interview with him. He says, you see the feedback, and you've got your data, and you see it matches, and you have no way of knowing this. This target was in another place, in other times, that could have been in another part of the universe. To me, this is just mind-blowing to this day, and I just don't understand why people don't get as excited as I do, because built within each of us, we have the ability to travel anywhere in time and space, and that thought alone drives me. It's just amazing to think about the potential we have as human beings, the potential we have if we just use it to go anywhere in time and space to be explorers. And that's what we ought to be as human beings. We're here to explore the human existence. That's a quote from Daz Smith, um, and I'm, I'm just editing that into a documentary I'm doing. It's a great great soundbite but that's how we feel about it now um in terms of it being it's not exactly like 
putting in a DVD that is virtual reality and then taking the ride. It's, it's a lot of work to get to the point where you get these brief glimpses. And while it's happening to you, it, it can be kind of spooky. It's kind of, it's this eerie little strange place that very often doesn't make sense. It's like, um, g- being led into a movie theater blindfolded and then you're given a, uh, like the roll of a toilet paper or a, uh, um, paper towel dispenser where you can look through it with one eye and then you get like a few seconds to look at the movie screen and then it shuts off and then you look at it a couple more seconds a few seconds later and you're trying to find the plot so you get these um glimpses and feelings and ideas about the target and you can't make conclusions about it you've just got to accept it and then try to go in for another look and then accept that and record it faithfully. Uh, so it's, it's not as easy or as fun as you think it might be. But then when you realize what you've done and get the feedback, it's, it's astounding. It's mind blowing. It's, it's like the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. It's, it's almost one of those things where if you really think about it, the ability to tap into different times and places and people's consciousness is, I mean, that's the, the golden key to the kingdom. And yeah, it's sometimes spooky when you, uh, (laughs) when you get into someone else's consciousness and you, uh, you start thinking thoughts that you wouldn't think like a murderer, a stalker, um, a psychopath, um, there was a guy that killed a girl in, uh, upstate Western Washington. And I remote viewed that target and I, I, I was there with him. I was him when he was disposing of the body and the thoughts he thought really shook me up because they're not the thoughts that I would think. And it kind of, it creeps you out to have those thoughts bubble up into your consciousness. Like, that's not me. Oh yeah. I mean, I can imagine that's got to definitely mess with your head and your just overall being. Um, It's like, it's like, why did I think that? Like, how could I possibly, how could I think of, I'm dragging a body down a hill, thump, thump, thump. And I have to get rid of this. Like I'm taking out the trash and like, I'm mad at the victim for being such a mess that I have to clean up. Oh my gosh. Was that something that the police asked you to remove you? No, it was done kind of for the family, but we, uh, I think we tried to give it to the police, but it was, it was all accurate. Um, I, I did get feedback on that one and it was accurate, but, um, yeah, that's disturbing thoughts to think when you, uh, think of disposing of someone and you have no no regard that it was a living human being and any feeling for what they went through or that they're dead just it's trash to be disposed of that just that is one of the creepiest remote viewing sessions that's always stayed with me can i can i jump in here real quick because this is very intriguing did you so you found you guys found the body after you did this session right Well, we didn't find the body. We correctly identified the location, but it was found um, independent of our work. Okay. And the family asked you to do this session? No, a family friend asked us to do it. Okay. And we did, the family was aware of our work, and... um, they did give us some feedback, but they were kind of disturbed. I mean, the family is just, we didn't want to intrude. You got to do of this course. real delicately. Of course. Um, but I drew the scene. We should publish this. I was going to do a, well, this was published in a IRVA magazine. Um, the, the, where, where her body was, was, where her remains were found. I drew that 
and uh, I got the Google Earth image, and it was just exact. I mean, it was it was really pretty good. That was a moment where I I did get that landform pretty exactly, and that's that's uh, you know that's you look at that and you go, oh wow, okay, yeah, this works, okay, yeah. Um, you try to be humble about it. Like, oh, how did I do that? Wow. Okay. Yeah, oh. that was a that was a disturbing one. And with such an amazing gift and ability, it's not even really a gift because you've earned this ability. You spent over ten years, fifteen years, working on this exercise to be able to remote view targets accurately. I'm just dumbfounded as to why there isn't a, you know, why you don't work directly for some homicide division or some military or you know for our military or something because you've just got such an ability to find these things and I, I just don't understand it maybe people are more interested in watching dancing with the stars or you know atlanta housewives well we have done some work for police agencies that's not um publicized and I think in terms of the military, I think they have, excuse me, <coughs> I'm sorry, I got a thing in my throat. Um, <coughs> I need some water. I think the uh, military has viewers that are probably far better than me. I think they still use it, and I think they have techniques and methods that we're not aware of. Do you think that they have techniques and such that will block certain objects or time frames from being remote viewed? I think that's possible. I don't have knowledge about, uh, well, I do have some knowledge about how that would be done. I've worked on it, but I'm not very good at it. I don't know what they're you can mask something, yes. Um, I've done some work on that. I can, uh, I could design a target, and I have designed a target that uh, I made up a target one time. <clears throat> I made up a location in my own mind that didn't exist, it was totally fictional. But I spent a lot of time designing it, visualizing it, drawing it. I had an artist draw the place. And that represented a totally different target. So that when the viewers remote viewed my target, they didn't see the real target. They saw the mask that I put up. So yes, that is possible. You can mask something. Um, it is possible to, uh, if you had very talented people who knew what they were doing, um, you could give out a target to all the, all the remote viewers in re civilian remote viewing today, and you could make it so that none of them got any information about the target any correct information. If you wanted to put the time and effort into doing it, it's, it's not easy. It would take like constant and continual effort and masking, but yeah, that can be done. That's getting into the real spooky parts of this. Did you follow that? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I did. I'm, I was going to, I was going to ask. So, and with that said, it makes you wonder what is real and if there are certain topics that the powers that be don't want discussed or objects or time frames, do they have a round table of individuals that have certain natural instincts and abilities to block these topics and such? It, it's really so, you can get so deep into it that it probably doesn't do anybody any good to go that far. And so, well, yeah, I, I think probably. There's stuff that the Soviets, or the Russians now, the Russians, 
the Americans and the Chinese, they're probably playing incredible games if we knew what was going on with them trying to probe each other and uh, block each other. I mean, the military remote viewers talked about this from back in their days in the 70s and 80s. And I'm sure it still goes on. In the civilian world, I don't know if any of us are getting into anything uh, important enough or sensitive enough that they would take the time and effort to try to block us. Now, when I did the 9-11 work for Courtney and I got the feedback, I, I did have a moment where I thought, hmm, I, and the Kennedy too, when I got the feedback <laughs> on that one, I thought, well now, I'm, maybe I'm sticking my nose into something where somebody's going to notice you have a little too much talent here, bud. Right. We don't, we don't want you looking at some things. And uh, Courtney feels that the powers that be are letting us do these projects and don't, you know, Kennedy, that's so long ago, and everybody knows that Oswald didn't kill Kennedy. So right. we're not, um, that was an interesting project, but we're not really... Uh, breaking any earth-shaking news there. 9-11. Um, I did get some information on 9-11 that we didn't publish. I'm thinking of publishing it, but Courtney, Courtney was too chicken to publish some of my work. Can, can you share it with us here at the Leak Project? Uh, let me think about this. I, I, uh, I will say this. Who, and it would be like, who, okay, a missile hit the Pentagon. He told we us know about that. a submarine. Daz and I both saw a missile. I saw a missile. I, I know it was a missile. It wasn't an airplane. I named the guy that pushed the button in the submarine that caused the missile to launch. And I know what uh, country that submarine was um, flagged under. So that was the that was what I got. And Courtney says, "Well, that's not corroborated, and we don't want to piss people <laughs> off. So we're not going to." put that in and I said okay I'll put that out on my own but yeah I did I did see the guy and I drew his flag and I'll I'll share that one time so a little later now, I don't know maybe maybe that's one that they don't want put out so. I think you actually shared that with us last time um, yeah I'm maybe sure our you did. little ally in the Middle East on occasion certain videos will come up that you can't monetize and they don't give you a reason as to why that does happen, doesn't it? Yeah, we've been aware of that. You know what's also creepy about YouTube is because uh, I have a YouTube channel, um, Cook Healthy Fast. I do vegetarian cooking, guitar, and weird stuff. <laughs> if if you use any the most obscure cut of music that you think they'd never catch you, you know, like... Um, I used a soundtrack from a from a CD, the station that I worked for. Okay, I'll admit this. I worked for a station, and they bought the license to some background soundtracks. They had this whole library. I mean, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of little, you know, like bumper music, like dot, 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 beep, 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 that kind of new right. soundtrack music. I used one of those. And boy, YouTube flagged that in about 10 minutes, like third party uh, content. You don't have authorization for this. It's like they have all algorithms that they, they can. It's amazing what how they can spy on us. <laughs> yes, it is. So, you know, let's get back into this session that you had with Sidonia, if we can. Um, I've always been fascinated with Mars and Sidonia, the pyramids that correlate with certain geometrical patterns and such. And then there's also the, the face of what looks like a sphinx that came out originally from the 70s from the Viking orbiter. And then they tried to debunk it and said that it was just uh, you know certain shadows or whatever, and that's what made it look like a perfectly good face. But you had the opportunity to remote view Sidonia and the anomalies and structures that were there. 
What can you tell us about that? Well, that was about two years ago. I believe it was, um, or was it a year ago? Yeah, it was, no, it was about, it was about a year and a half ago. It was fall of 2014. And Courtney said, well, we want you to do a project. It's like project 10, and your first target is going to be 10A. All right. So I, all right, I'm going to remote view. So I sit down with my pen and paper, and I cool down, and I get get ready. I I set everything up, and I, I realize that at, okay, 6 o'clock tonight, I'm going to remote view this target. It's 10A. So I'm trying to not think about it, but I'm just gearing myself up. I eat some good food. I meditate. I get turn off my phone, and I'm thinking about it all day, and I'm, just getting ready, like at 6 o'clock, I'm going to be extraordinary. And so I uh, I start working this, and I see like a hill. I'm like, okay. And then I work, and I get land. It's land. It's more land. It's static. It's There's no people. There's no structures like not city there's no machinery you know when you when you when you do a remote viewing target you you get into it little by little like you're you're getting low level data is it complex or is it simple is it moving or is it just sitting there and my sense of this target was it was real simple it was just like barren land i don't hear any people talking there's no machinery there's no technology there's uh, no trees. It's just land. It's just barren land. And I, I keep looking at it, keep looking at it, probing. And it, a couple times, I got a really clear look at it. And it was weathered, eroded, brown, brownish gray land, like a hillside. And... Uh, Every time I looked at it, I just saw this vast expanse of brown dirt. And this hill looked like, um, you know, the famous picture of Iwo Jima where the Marines are raising the flag? That's called Mount Suribachi. It right. reminded me of that. It was like, this looks like Mount Suribachi. So I drew that and described it, and I, I turned in my session, and... Courtney said, I want you to um, do a video session on that. I go, really? I, it seems like pretty damn boring to me. You want a video session? And he can't tell me anything. He just goes, look, I can't comment on this. Just um, do your work. You want me to do a video on that? Yes. Okay. So I set up my video camera. And I review my work, and then I put in my little earbuds with my soundtrack to entrain myself, and I get into my thing, and I start sketching what I'd seen. And then I go farther, and then I'm standing there, and I said, well, there's, there's ice here. It's, it's like uh, um, not glaciers, but almost, yeah, it's like there's um, crevices, and it's rocky. And it still seemed real boring to me. And what I was viewing was that mountain at Sedonia. And if you look at my work, it was it looks exactly like the, I don't think there's a face there, but it's weathered, it's worn, it's brown, and I got that. And then I said, um, "There's something underneath it." I go, "There's got to be something more interesting than this." So I I. I had seen, I had sent something beneath it. So, I, okay, I reset my consciousness and I looked underneath. And what I got was these like tunnels. It was like the Tokyo subway. If Tokyo had had an earthquake and the thing was flooded and it was ruined and it was two centuries later or a thousand years later, it was damaged, it was decaying. And that was my sense. It was 
man-made, not natural, but these tubes and tunnels that were interconnected that was this old transportation system. So I, I think to myself, well, that's interesting. I wonder what this was like when it was, before it was decrepit. So I did another target. And this time I moved myself back in time and I'm going, wow, this is a long time ago. This is like, this could be a million years. Uh, and then I popped into this tunnel and it was modern. There was like a maglev train kind of thing or something electromagnetic moving really fast transportation. There were lights, there were computer sensors at intervals. And this was this interlocking transportation system that was way more high tech than the Tokyo subway, uh, like the futuristic, uh, advanced maglev subway system. This, you could travel the plan. Oh, I remember my thought was why would you travel in a tube through the air pushing gases, you know, like an airplane when you could travel all around this planet underneath it through these tunnel systems that go really, really fast with this hot, it just was very, very high tech. And it turned out that the targets I had worked were Sidonia Mars current time. That was the barren, nothing there. And then the, the high tech one was Sidonia Mars in the past when it was active. So is that literally true? Did I see that? Was it really there? I don't know. I mean, we may never know, but that was my perception. Uh, and it was real interesting to me. So, and that's, that's worth watching. That's on the video that people can go to farsight.org and uh, click on the Sidonia link. And that's a streaming video. You got to pay a few bucks. It'll eventually be out for free, but yeah, that's one of the videos that Courtney put out. Now, do you think what do you think caused Mars to go from such a prosperous planet to a barren <coughs> uh something catastrophic? Um I didn't really get the cause of that. That wasn't tasked to me. So that wasn't a target that I worked and I never I never went off on a tangent and got a sense of that. Now, what's the, there are different, you know, there are theories that there was a war. There was a, maybe another planet came by and caused, I don't know, there's any number of theories, but I don't have any personal direct remote viewing data that would address that. Have you had an opportunity to remote view Phobos? Um, I may have done that. Oh, that's the, that's the, um, there's Phobos. That's the, that's the, um, the moon of the Mars. moon. Wasn't there a satellite? The Russians set up a, a probe called Phobos that saw the UFO before it was destroyed. Or yeah. I'm, yeah. There, there were several. So there's satellites. two different Phobos. Yeah. I, I haven't remote viewed either of those. I might've done the Russian satellite as a training target uh, 15 years ago, but I don't really remember. Okay. Now, one of the other sessions that you've had the past couple of years that I found amazing, I've always been fascinated with Iapetus and how much it looks like the Death Star from Star Wars. Uh, you know, what could you tell us about that session? I was not really... Uh, I didn't know much about Iapetus before I did the session. Again, it was a blind session. So uh, we don't send ourselves there. We don't know. It could be anything, anywhere, anytime. And it was another one of those where I got, oh, this is a really barren place. Oh, this is boring. I said, okay, this is a crater. I said, is this the moon? Is this Mars? I got this barren gray crater with a steep rock wall. And I'm looking around. And if you look at my work and my drawing, and that's another video that Courtney has out, and you can see the verifiable aspects that I got are 
pretty remarkable. I mean, I, I drew this crater pretty much exactly. And then um, I saw some structure within the crater that was built in the wall of the crater. And it was kind of like a, a, a view. What's the word? Um, like a picture window or something. This concrete picture window. And so I went back and I looked at that. And I again, I did a time movement. Like, well, this isn't there now, but it was there long ago. And why is this here? And I had a sense, you know, like an hour into the session, I'm thinking... This seems to me to be a barren, off-planet, like I was thinking Europa or what are the other moons in our... I didn't, I didn't consciously know of Iapetus. I'd never, I wasn't familiar with that name. But I was right. thinking this is some distant planet or distant moon or something, and it's lifeless now. But there's something interesting here that I need to see, and it's this structure. So if you're if you're thinking consciously about why would there be a structure on a moon, oh mining, uh, military outpost, uh, scientific observations, and I didn't get any of that. What came to me was, this is like a resort. This was built by somebody really rich that had uh, amazing technology and resources, and it was like to take their friends there for lunch or for the weekend because the view of Saturn, I looked up in the sky and I said, there is something so, the most amazing thing in the sky is this big, bright thing, and it, it's Saturn. If you're on Iapetus and you your view of Saturn, it, it may be the most stunning view in our solar system. Now, how long ago do you think that it was built? Uh, long time ago, millennia, um, way, may, you know, millions, billions of years, uh, certainly tens, hundreds of thousands. Um, that's a tough one to calibrate as a remote viewer. You would need, uh, You'd need celestial navigation and trigonometry and a lot of skills that I don't really currently possess. But just on a, on a, you know, a, with what tools I had, a feeling backward was a long time ago. That's the best I can say. Do you think that the people that built it were from planet Earth? Um, no. I, I didn't get a sense they were from Earth. I got a sense um, they were they were alien. I I got a here here was my sense of who they were, and I'm sorry to be so vague on some of this, Rex, because I I don't want I don't make things up in remote. I mean, I hopefully don't. Um, I just can only give you the impressions that I get in the remote viewing session and sometimes that's limited. I do remember thinking like who built this well and the 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 thought flow that happened in that moment was we think of aliens as being benevolent and um kind of uh not materialistic like these uh, spiritual beings that aren't concerned with petty things. You know, the star people there are here to guide us and altruistic. <laughs> right. But my sense of these aliens was um, they were like, like the 1% on Earth. There were some of them are rich and powerful and would build a, use their technology to build a place that was really opulent. Just to be a uh, like, hey, I'm so rich and powerful. I have a weekend retreat on Iapetus. You can come watch uh, Saturn rise. It's the most stunning thing you've ever seen. And they built this just to go watch Saturn rise and to show off. Like, let's go have lunch uh, at my restaurant on Iapetus. 
Well, because and, they could. And could you walk us through like some of the interior aspects of this resort that was built? Okay, I'm trying to remember. It was. Uh, it had the resort itself. I got. I had a sense of that it was had healing properties. It was a place that beans would go to, to like, uh, you know, like it, you'd take mud baths or mineral water, but not mud baths or mineral water. It was uh, there was something there that they that seemed to be a uh, like a spa resort, um, some place that. It was. It had a stark beauty because looking out of this picture window in the cliff, all you see is this barren moon. Um, no, no place that would support life. But the inside was very opulent, like um, the most luxurious casino hotel in Las Vegas. You know, like Grecian stuff, um, gold leaf artwork so the inside was very comfortable and very ornate and then there was a support some support structures that was like the staff was there and they got resupplied by a ufo type of thing now this may all be bullshit you keep in mind that <laughs> I, I may just be making all this up and none of it may be true it may be a dream i had it may be just me making stuff up to try to um, satisfy Courtney Brown's tasking, even though I didn't know what the tasking was. So take it with a grain of salt. Don't take it as I'm telling you that this is absolute truth. I'm just saying these are the things that occurred to my mind in the remote viewing process. And also, I should also point out, Rex, that, you know, when I was coming on the show with you today, you said, hey, give me a link. I don't have a website currently. I'm not selling anything. I'm not officially affiliated with any group. I guess you can link to Farsight where Courtney's doing some of these projects, but I'm not um, I'm not trying to come on here and say, hey, believe me, I'm the world's best remote viewer. Uh, I can teach you the path of enlightenment. I'm, I, I do this because it's interesting. I don't get paid for it, and I'm not selling it right now so um, I, I don't know if that gives me any more or less credibility it's just something I do because uh, it's really interesting and I try to do it under a good protocol so yeah I saw this opulent place that people went to see the sites and the site was quite amazing I mean imagine watching the moon rise on earth or watch imagine being on the moon and watching earth rise you know that famous picture the astronauts took? Right. Now imagine being on Iapetus and seeing Saturn from up close, those rings of Saturn. If that was a, I mean, if, if I could tell you, Rex, you know, if you, if you had enough money, I could put you on a vehicle and transport you to a resort on Iapetus where you could spend the weekend and have great food and luxury and, and just gaze out at Saturn and it would be a life-changing experience for you. You you would want to do that, and of that's course. my sense of of that's my sense of of why that was built. So, and I it wasn't anything that I thought I made up, although I might have. <laughs> well, it's certainly incredible what you do, and the fact that you do it for free is even more fascinating and fantastic. And one of the more recent projects that you've had the opportunity to be involved in was the remote viewing session on Hitler and what his mind was actually thinking at the time. I actually just watched that today and I was hoping I could get your thoughts and views on what that project was like. That was done last uh, fall. So about six months ago, well, four months ago, end of last summer. And it was sandwiched in between, uh, the Kennedy stuff. 
So it was like I was given a bunch of targets, and one of them was Kennedy, and then one of them turned out to be Hitler, and then the other one was another part of the Kennedy. So it's we Courtney does that to keep us guessing, so we don't know what we're doing. So in that Hitler project, I remo- I did two targets, and you've only seen one of them. I have another one that I'm holding off that I'm going to put out, and that's going to be the really cool one. I, I don't can't wanna, wait to see it. I don't want to take any, uh, you know, steal any thunder from Courtney's current one because it's a good project. But uh, wait till you see mine. <laughs> I'm going to put a documentary together on that in a couple months. Great. So I did all this stuff, and I knew this was a famous person. I knew it was a significant person. I knew it was something that changed history. I never knew it was Hitler. I was I was sitting there looking at. Um, did you see me in this video? I can't remember because I do so many videos. That there was one point. It might be in the unreleased part, but I I go. I should know this guy. I don't know who it is. It's somebody famous, but I never thought Hitler. So, to me, I know that that's good remote viewing data because I never consciously figured it out. Sometimes your data is better when you don't. You remember when I did 9-11 and toward the end I went, is this effing 9-11? Yeah. <laughs> when I did Hitler, I never said, oh, my God, is this Hitler? I, I turned in the work and I said, well, I think it's somebody that was significant, but I have no idea. I don't know who it was. Um, when I got onto him, it was a uh, it was a guy at a podium giving an impassioned speech. And there were a lot of people listening to it. And he was, uh, I said, what did I say? Like, if he was a preacher, they're buying what he's selling. Like, <laughs> yeah. he's really give it, he's really got a lot, he's a charismatic guy. Right. And interesting to me was that I felt there was a lot of intrigue. Oh, I remember the, the people I said, uh, I never figured out he was speaking German. I said, yeah, he's he's saying this, this, and they're affirming it. They're going like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they're going, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. And I never heard Sieg Heil. And I, I probably should have if I was a really on remote viewer that day, but I didn't get that. I never I never got it. I, I got the cadence of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're affirming it. Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. I knew it was political. I knew that he was, Daz got more of his anger and his passion. I knew he was passionate. I got him more like a salesman, like he was trying to convince them of stuff. What else? Uh, I sensed that there were people on stage with him, and there were at the Reichstag, that uh, didn't agree with him and were plotting against him. So there was like a revolt happening behind the scenes, which I think is probably true. Interesting thing about that, when I got feedback, Courtney told me it was Hitler's speech to the Reichstag. And I had drawn the structure with these curving arches and a facade and a squarish building. I drew it pretty specifically in my paper session. And uh, I went and I looked up the Reichstag building, and it didn't really look like the building I, I drew. And I went, oh, I was wrong. I saw the wrong building, or I misinterpreted that. And then later, when we were researching the project, Courtney told me, oh, you know that that particular speech that I targeted he wasn't, um, it wasn't at the Reichstag because they had burned it down. They were meeting at the Kroll Opera House. So I looked up the Kroll Opera House and it looks just like what I drew. Wow. So that was an interesting bit of feedback, which is valuable to me as a, as a remote viewer. Now, the FBI.gov slash vault there is a some white papers that are declassified that you can read about how Hitler actually escaped 
Germany, he faked his death, and he left <coughs> by a submarine to Argentina. Did you were you able to go that far into a session like remote view him that far out, or did you stop with while he was in you know as far as the session goes while he was still in Germany? Well, the session that Courtney is currently publishing was targeted to his speech the Reichstag, so I stopped there. But I did another unpublished target involving Hitler later, several weeks later. And it was tasked to Hitler's death. And what I got was very, very interesting. And that's going to be a video that I'm going to put out. And I'm going to produce it myself. Um, the being shot in the head, suicide, that was faked. And I, and I think my data shows that pretty clearly. And I saw Hitler dying as an old man without a mustache, full of regrets, died in bed, a very old man. And I got where he was buried. I said he was buried anonymously. So it matches the Argentina story. I believe he did go to Argentina. I, I didn't get Argentina in my remote viewing data, but I didn't get him dying in the bunker. Well, this is something we're certainly looking forward to seeing here at the League Project. Now, 25 years ago, okay, I'm 38, and actually, let's go back even further than that. 30 years ago, I knew about Hitler and, you know, basically his persona. My, I remember my mom telling me that he committed suicide and he burnt himself to the point to where nobody could see, you know, could basically recognize him. And I thought to myself, why would such a powerful person do something like that? And I, and, and I immediately thought, he didn't kill himself. I, I'm eight years old at the time, and I'm thinking, this, this guy didn't kill himself. He faked his death and did something else. And then 30 years later, I read about it on the FBI.gov slash vaults website where they talk about these white papers, where there's white papers that specifically say that he didn't die. He left for Argentina. So very fascinating. And Well, see, yeah. See, that was your intuition. When you're eight years old and your mom tells that and you— you just knew at a gut level that wasn't right. That's not true, and you were right, and that's your intuition. That's your higher self, your subconscious told you that. You didn't believe the story, and you didn't know why, but you just knew it was right, and it turns out to be right. So that's your intuition. You know, when you guys tapped into his mind, and when I'm saying you guys, I'm referring to you and Daz, Daz really felt some super negative energy, and he left – one time frame and went into another another time frame and he talks about this you know non emotional presence and gas like physicality did you go into his afterlife or did did you stay within i followed and i i i only got hitler on a physical level what I got in this, this isn't in the current project. So this isn't in the one that Courtney just put out. I got a sense of the person that was, they, somebody was shot in the head. It wasn't Hitler. Um, it was like an actor or a double. And I, I got a sense of that, like that guy, um, going through the death event and realizing, oh, this is all a charade and it's all okay and seeing his family and going to the other side real briefly. But Daz, Daz got more into the afterlife than I did. <clears throat> so my, my current data, people can see that by going to farsight.org um, and there's a link on that. You can see the trailer for free. Um, I think the trailer's on the site, and then the, the streaming video is up. But there's more to come. There is more to come on that one. Um, you know, Courtney and I have interesting discussions, because Courtney's view of history is not the same as mine, and his view of the remote viewing data. We, we uh, are sometimes in conflict, which is very healthy. I mean, that's good. Yeah. Uh, and we have really interesting conversations, and he said he wasn't going to put out the uh, the death event. He said, "Well, we we failed. We didn't really get conclusive stuff on that." I said, "Courtney, he didn't he didn't die there." And Courtney goes, "No, he did die, but he didn't <laughs> kill himself. 
he was he wouldn't have killed himself. They killed him. The Nazis killed him, and they did it because they didn't want him to be captured. And I go, no, no, Courtney, that's that's. And so we argued over that, and he says, well, I'm not going to put this out. And I said, well, let me put it out the the way I think it should be put out. He said, okay, that's what's cool about Courtney. Um, even though I sign off my work to him, he doesn't own it. He says, you know, after I put it out, you can do whatever you want with it. You can put it in your own version. Your own work is your own intellectual property, which is as it should be. You know what I mean? Right. Absolutely. I mean, you're, uh, I don't want to get into the ugly stuff that just happened, but a viewer's work is his own work. No one owns that. The, if, if I train you how to remote view Rex, I would never say I own your work or could limit you from publishing it in, in any way. That's, that's how I think it should be. So well, that's all I, I'm going to say on that. And I said in my statement, if, if someone doesn't like who I associate with, or they don't like the, 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 data I'm getting, you can criticize that. You won't hurt my feelings. You're free to criticize that. And, and I've said this, this is the third time I've said it on this show. My data that I got with Courtney on these UFO targets, and that's not all we do. It may not be right. I may have made it up. I mean, not, not intentionally. I'm not trying to deceive anyone. Um, I, I, I couldn't honestly tell you if it's right or wrong. Um, I think it's interesting when Daz and I get very similar data. I believe my 9-11 stuff was very true. Uh, I know it was done legitimately blind. I think uh, when I did the JFK stuff, I called up Jim Mars and I said, Hey, Jim Mars, you're the top researcher on uh, JFK. I want you to look at my session. And he looked at it and he said, I believe it. And he he found things that I didn't know that turned out to be true. So anyway, the, the the bottom line is, let's be positive. Let's promote this amazing skill. Let's 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 improve humanity and uh, and explore consciousness together and do it in a friendly way. That's how, that's where I'm coming from. Absolutely. And what's next for you, Dick? Oh, we've got some uh, we've got some cool stuff coming. Um, Daz, we, Daz Smith did a target uh, that I'm I'm going to be releasing. I'm editing it right now, and that. That's going to be not put out by Farsight. I think Daz is going to put it out for free. I'm going to edit it for him for free just to because he's my friend and I just want to promote, like I said, consciousness. And so I'm not going to charge. I'm just doing a video and I'm going to let him release that how he wants to. If he wants to charge, he can, but I won't get anything for it. So I got that coming up. I've got my other Hitler session that I'm going to produce, and I've got some big names that are going to help with that. That'll come out in a few months. And then Courtney is working on a new scientific project. We had our fun in the last couple of years. We did uh, the alien stuff, Iapetus and the Phoenix Lights. We did 9-11. We did uh, Kennedy. We're going to go back to science. We're going to, Courtney's going to um, design a, a scientific uh, project that has absolute pure scientific protocols. We have a luminary. We have a famous person that's going to help us task it and may write a book about it. And so we're going to do some more work. And maybe later this year or early next year, we'll have an astounding project coming out with a series of targets I can't that's all I know about it I can't because I'm a viewer I can't be told exactly anything about it just that something's coming out and it's going to be scientific other than that I don't Great. know about it. hey but yeah. yeah we want we want to get back to 
you know, Courtney Brown is a PhD, Dr. Courtney Brown. He's a major university professor. And he has his little tangents. He likes to go off after aliens, <laughs> but uh, and he likes the sexy projects, you know, JFK, 9-11. But we're going to go back to something that is uh, very scientific. So that's what's next for me. I may do some private training, uh, not in the immediate future, but over the horizon, I may be doing some training. Figuring out how to do that. So yeah, I'll be active in remote viewing. Uh, it's it's very very interesting stuff. You know, it's it's certainly appreciative of you to spend your time to come on here with us at the Leak Project, and you know, certainly hope you'll keep us informed. We'll stay in touch, Rex. I always enjoy talking with you. Absolutely, it's and been... that that little voice when you were eight years old that told you. Hitler didn't kill himself. Listen to that voice because that's the right guy talking to you. That's the truth. <laughs> right right on, right. Dick. I really Thanks a lot. It. I'll see you, man. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. A very special thank you to our guest tonight. For all of you that had the opportunity to be here with us, if you enjoyed the show, follow us on YouTube. YouTube.com slash clandestine time lord for the most recent interviews, videos, and podcasts. Or you can check us out on the World Wide Web, www.leakproject.com. Would you like to be a guest on our show? Do you have information that the world needs to see and hear? Send us an email, guestbookings at leakproject.com. Thank you, everybody. This is Rex Bear with Leak Project. Stay safe and be the change you want to see. Good night.